unpopular truth. Because a truth is unpopular does not mean that it should not be proclaimed. Mankind is made up of emotional beings, but emotions can lie to us and deceive us. When truth is mixed with error, there is always compromise. When truth is mixed with error, there is always compromise. If our minds and hearts are not filled with God's truth, something else will take its place. Cynicism, occultism, false religions, and philosophies and drugs, the list is endless. That's a quote from the Reverend Billy Graham. The late Billy Graham. In Isaiah 65, starting in verse 1, the Lord said, I'd made myself accessible to those who didn't ask for me. I let myself be found by those who didn't seek me. I said, Hineni, Hineni, here am I. Here am I. Hineni is that complex phrase which indicates readiness, alertness, attentiveness, receptivity, responsiveness, and obedience to instruction. The Lord says, Hineni, to a nation not called by my name. And I spread out my hands all day to uh, long to a rebellious people who live in a way that is not good, who follow their own inclinations. Makashaba, which is their own thoughts, devices, plan, purposes, or inventions. Verse 3, a people who provoke me to my face all the time, sacrificing in gardens and burning incense on bricks. They sit among the graves and spend the night in caverns. They eat pig meat, and their pots hold soup made from disgusting things. They say, keep your distance. Don't come near me because I am holier than you. They are smoke in my nose, a fire that burns all day. See, it is written before me, I will not be silent until I repay them. I will repay them to the full. God calls out to a nation that includes sinners and may I have not called out to him. Yet in an extraordinary gesture, he spreads out his hands to them by humans spreading out their hands to God, which is usually the case. What is being described here are pagan, cultic practices and rituals among those who profess to be following Adonai. Worship of or praying to the dead, sitting among the graves. This is also a wordplay, a Hebrew idiom of being spiritually dead. Either way, they're engaged in disgusting practices that become haughty and say, hey, we're holier than you. Adonai states these practices result in charges written down, recorded before him all these disgusting practices for which he will repay. These people walk an idolatrous, pagan, false religion, even though God has called out to them and made himself available. It's critical to see what makes him angry, following our own thoughts, inclinations, and religious inventions. This has burdened me for decades. It's a driving force behind what we do for Adonai. Yes, I desire and seek the salvation of all Israel, but I also seek the same for Christianity, for Christians, for all believers who fall into this scriptural category, for Gentile restoration and reconciliation with Messianic Israel. Many engage in traditions of religious practices contrary to scripture, yet falsely believe all is well. This could quite possibly be the greatest deception ever in the kingdom of God and the history of mankind. Breaking through this facade of falsehood is almost impossible. Almost. Many, many times I've just wanted to shake believers and scream, wake up! I feel such anguish and heartache over those who engage in these false, unscriptural practices and expressions of worship that actually alienate them from Adonai, his kingdom, and his son, and results in severe judgment. I'm not worried about who will be offended when I speak truth. I'm concerned about those who will be misled, deceived, and punished if I don't. How can I know what I'm saying is true? How can you know what I'm saying is true? It's the lack of power in the greater body. It's the lack of signs and wonders in the greater body. I've mentioned this many times over the last 20 years. If you compare to what we're doing today, to Acts chapter 1 through 6, we don't see it. We're not experiencing the fullness and the power and the outpouring of God's presence and glory, which means there's something wrong in the house. And we've got to bring restoration and wholeness and the power, the deutimous power of God back into his body. There's a psychological effect to this. It's known as cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance are life situations involving conflict, attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors. This produces a feeling of mental discomfort 
which leads to the necessity to alter either the attitude, the belief, or the behavior to reduce this internal struggle and restore balance. For example, gluttony, overeating. That's a behavior. Even though, I just personally now, even though I know obesity is causing my hypertension, diabetes, and a host of other medical issues, that's the cognition, I remain in a state of cognitive dissonance, unwilling to change the behavior. They'll alter the truth, their core belief, rather than change. We're all going to die of something, right? Well, I, I'm overweight because of diabetes. But the irony is we have diabetes because we're overweight. You get this? So rather than change the behavior, we change a core truth to make it fit our narrative of beliefs. People will resolve cognitive dissonance by blindly believing a falsehood, altering truth to fit their behavior narrative by changing their behavior in order to align with the truth. I've shared this before. I've had people brazenly tell me directly to my face over the years, Rabbi, I know what you're saying is truth, but I'm not going to change my behavior and lifestyle. I've shared this numerous times. That's the person in the hospital outside in their gown with their IV rack smoking a cigarette. That's cognitive dissonance. Rather than face the reality of the truth of that behavior and stopping it, they're seeking a short-term healing. They do not desire to be made whole. We see cognitive dissonance throughout biblical history. Not everyone throughout Scripture has listened to divine truth and believed. An entire generation perished wandering in the desert because of their belief of the false report of the ten spies instead of the two that spoke God's truth. In Jeremiah 42, we're in Jeremiah, Jeremiah now, and a divine mentor. Shortly we'll be at Jeremiah 42. This is one of my most striking stories for me scripturally. You've got a, a military commanders and a remnant of people that are running from the Chaldeans and Nebuchadnezzar. They're up by Bethlehem, and they come across Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah's prophesied everything that's happening that's happening. He said specifically, they're coming from the north. These are the people. If you, if, if you will just obey and submit, nothing will happen. They refuse to do it. And Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem, tore down the temple. You got this group of people that are running. They come across Jeremiah. They know he's a prophet of God in Jeremiah 42. And they say, Jeremiah, pray to God on our behalf, and we will do whatever you say to do. Ten days Jeremiah prays, and he goes back to them, and this gets into Jeremiah 43, and he says, the Lord says, stay here and submit to the Lord. You'll be safe in the land. Jeremiah said, the Lord said, if you go to Egypt, you'll die by the sword in Egypt. Stay here in the land. You know what their response was? You're a liar. And they went to Egypt. That's cognitive dissonance. For 20 years, I've done my absolute best to present the unadulterated truth of the entire word of God. Not filtered through religious conjecture, doctrine, or dogma, just the word. John 8, starting at verse 31, So Yeshua said to the Judeans who had trusted him, If you obey what I say, then you are really my Talmudim. So a Talmudim is someone, a disciple, someone who mimics the master. So to mimic the master, we've got to do what he says. Verse 32 says, You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This takes me right back to Yeshua's Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20. He said, I've not come to do away with one jot, one tittle of the Torah. And anybody who teaches otherwise will be what? Least in the kingdom of God. He says, I've not come to do away with, but to fulfill. We cannot begin restoration and revival until we restore biblical truth back into our relationship with God, our lives, our families, our congregations, even our expression of worship. Hearing the unaltered, unadulterated word of God is refreshing. It's powerful. It restores truth and the supernatural back into the greater body. Psalms 119, verse 160. The main thing about your word is this. It's true. And all your just rulings last forever. Olam in the Hebrew, forever and ever. Everlasting, evermore, perpetual, continuous existence, everlasting, indefinite for eternity. His commands and rulings are all long. They are forever. Amen. To move forward and walk in the fullness, the power of the Spirit, the truth of God's Word, to become one, Jew and Gentile, we, the greater body of Messiah, we've got to confront this pink elephant sitting in the room. 
the false teachings and the theology that's deceived the greater body, that's resulted in this separation between Jew and Gentile, apostasy from his word, with our love growing cold and lukewarm relationship with that or not. A church disconnected from Israel isn't God's plan. It's just another religion. Can I say that again? A church disconnected from Israel is not God's plan. It's just another religion. Hasatan has been at work for millennia to deceive, to inject falsehood, to separate, divide, to conquer the greater body through error, to lead God's people away from truth into apostasy and sin. Yeshua spoke to this, and he warned us in our day today to be on guard. In Matthew 24, starting in verse 11, he said, Many false prophets will appear and fool many people, and many people's love will grow cold because of increased distance from Torah. That word in the Hebrew is anomia. Nomia means unalterable, unchangeable. The A before it in the Greek means it's without. Anomia, this means one thing only in the Greek, without Torah. A lie is always 95% truth. The verse in the King James says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I iniquity means the absence of moral or spiritual values. It means morally objectionable behavior, lack of uprightness with ungoverned appetite, defiance of the law, not subject or restrained by the law, entertaining civil disturbance and willful disobedience. Though this is partially true, Iniquities are behaviors that come to pass because of apostasy from Torah. Anomia means without Torah, without submission and obedience to God's word, we see and experience these wicked behaviors. Just this past week, Charisma Magazine talked about two major ministry men of God that have put on indefinite suspension for inappropriate behavior. One, an international evangelist, another, a university dean. People that have been serving God for 40 years. People's love don't grow cold because of objectionable behavior. They have objectionable behaviors because they are separated from God's word, his teachings of life. This is apostasy. One small thing at a time, slow but steady, century after century, until 2,000 years after Yeshua walked the earth, his bride looks and dresses like the world. They don't keep God's timeline, his clock, his feast. It isn't obedient to the word. It's tolerating anti-Semitism, bigotry, injustice, Jezebel, adultery, homosexuality, abortion, same-sex marriage, drugs, the occult, on and on and on. And why is this? Because Yeshua said in Matthew 24 that their love will grow cold because of separation, of apostasy from his word. Adonai's word is truth and power all of it, not just certain chapters or sections, not some portions with the others being done away with. It's the whole thing. 1 John 5, starting at verse 2, it says, Here's how we know that we love God's children. When we love God, we also do what he commands. Now, I'm going to eject this like I've done a thousand times in the last 20 years. When this was written, there's no New Testament. The New Testament is 300 plus years in the future. So what's he talking about? The Tanakh. Come on, the Psalms. Kings, Chronicles, Torah, the first five books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Verse 3, for loving God means obeying his commands. Moreover, his commands are not burdensome. Somehow this scripture isn't referenced in the hyper-love messages in the body today. Loving God is obedience to him, his word, all of his word. It's an unpopular truth, yet it's recorded in scripture. And it even says the same in the King James Version. Disobedience is the real pandemic in America and the free world, not COVID-19. Falsehood is the rule of the day. A majority of people are willingly deceived because it fits their own personal narrative and their behavior patterns. We're back to cognitive dissonance. When unbiblical behavior is confronted by truth, they'll alter or ignore that truth so they don't have to change the behavior. It's hard to comprehend that communism and socialism is gaining favor in America among the young people, yet that entitlement generation will believe the lie of socialism and communism so they can get even more things for free without initiative and hard work. It's a lie. There's another unpopular truth that must be revealed in our current racial and civil unrest that's been hijacked by untruth. 
I'm going to say it once again. I am against the organization of Black Lives Matter. Go back and read their core tenets, go to their website, and it is anti-everything we stand for in the kingdom of God. Every, they are self-proclaimed, uh, Marxist, Marxist trained. One is an ex-convict, was a terrorist, a domestic terrorist. It's insane, the traction they've gotten. And yet the whole purpose is to deceive and get us off focus from the real truth. African Americans are 12% of the U.S. population. 12%. But yet they account for 40% of the nation's abortions. The black race population in America is facing extinction. Dr. Raleigh Washington is writing a book on this. He can't get this on the street fast enough. The black race population in America is facing extinction. The very goal of Planned Parenthood's founder, Margaret Sanger, and her vision for racial ethnic cleansing. And let me pause for a second. Everyone in here is guilty of it. You're all guilty. Every person in here, you're guilty of it. You know why? You're paying taxes, and they get taxpayer money to fund what they're doing. Of the 57 million abortion deaths in America, 40% over 20 million were African-American babies. You know what that's called? Genocide. The birth rate required to sustain a community of race is 2.1. It's this figure called RNI. You take the birth rate compared to the death rate, and you've got, you got to have a 2.1 number or higher to sustain your population. Right now in America, it's about 2.4. The African-American birth rate is 1.8. In less than 25 years, the black birth rate will become irreversible, leading to the extinction of the black race in America in between 50 to 60 years. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the Supreme Court, speaking of Planned Parenthood, expressed her concern for population growth, particularly growth in population that we don't want to have too many of. What's the real crisis? I can tell you they got to all focus against the police. I, I, I'm going to stand here right now. Nobody in this room wants to defund the police. Do we need correction? Yes. Do we need modernization? Do we need oversight? Yes, 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 yes. Someone's got to get involved in the police unions. It's, you know, we, we need some transparency there. However, no one wants to pick up the phone call 911 and get a busy signal. Come on. So we're all hovering around here, but what's the real issue? Genocide. Listen to me. In 25 years, there'll be no black people left in America because of abortion. The most racist act you could do this November is vote pro choice. The most racist act anybody in this room can do, I don't care what color you are or what culture you are, the most racist thing you will do the first week of November is vote for choice. It's genocide. Another unpopular truth. To date, as of yesterday, 470 homicides this year in Chicago. Just Chicago. Last year, 2019, they had 352. It's up to 470 this year. 78.7 of those murdered are black, 370. 71% of the murderers are black. 37 were 16 years old and younger. Yet the African-American population of Chicago is only 33%. One third, one third of the population suffers 80% of the murders. I don't have enough time to mention L.A., Atlanta, New York, Miami, Dallas. I, I could do this all night long. So here's the question. Why won't the city leaders in these places get involved and stop it?
Could that be the reason? Does this parallel the narrative with abortion? Could it be that we've got a group of people that don't want, could they be complicit in these deaths? Why are we hearing this on the evening news? These are staggering numbers. These make me sick to my stomach. There's a group of these children that were toddlers, toddlers, babies, innocent babies shot dead playing in front of their house. There's overwhelming deception in our society, our culture, ethics, and religion, our government, our judicial system. Deception is prevalent in our media. There's great deception in the curriculum of our schools and universities. Truth is unpopular. This has been going on for 2,000 years. We need to only look inward regarding our own history to study how the church became separated from the Jewish rooted olive tree. Already by 60 AD, Paul warned the incoming Gentile believers that abandoning their connection to the Jewish people would be a big mistake. He's concerned that the Gentiles would become arrogant, thinking they can recreate their own version of the faith in Yeshua, detached from his Jewish root. That's Romans 11, verses 25 and 26. 60 AD, he's writing this. Unfortunately, Shaul, Paul's warning, it wasn't heeded, and the separation has been unfolding over the last 2,000 years through supersessionism, false teaching, false religion, denial, and apostasy from Scripture through cognitive dissidence. This doesn't fit my narrative for life, so I'll change the truth. Does the word really say that? Oh, that's been done away with. Cognitive dissidence. The prophet Isaiah revealed in the end of the book that bears his name, a one new man future where there's a universal global recognition by Adonai of those who are not obedient and following him. This is, this is very somber to read. Yet it's where we're at today. And it picks right up where we just read in Isaiah 65. It's repeated again in the very next chapter, Isaiah 66, starting at verse 17. Those who consecrate and purify themselves in order to enter the gardens then follow the one who was already there, eating the pig meat, the reptiles, and the mice, will all be destroyed together, says Adonai. He says in verse 22 of Isaiah 66, just as there are new heavens and a new earth that I am making will continue in my presence. This goes right hand in hand with Revelation. This is fascinating. So will your descendants in your name continue. Every month, verse 23, on Rosh Chodesh, and every week on Shabbat, Everyone living, everyone living, Chal Bashar in the Hebrew, Chal is all, the whole, each, every, totality, Bashar is humans, all living things, all mankind. Chal Bashar, everyone will come to worship in my presence, says Adonai, when? When? If it's going to be done in the end, why isn't it done now? And, and this is so specific, because what eventually I hear back is, well, that's just for you Jews. It's a Jew, this is your Jewish day. You guys do your Jewish day. This is not only all humankind, all living things, all creation will come to worship in my presence, says Adonai on Shabbat. As they leave, verse 24, they will look on the corpses of the people who rebelled against me. For their worm will never die, their fire will never be quenched, but they will be abhorrent to all humanity. Hmm. Isaiah is referencing the same practices from Isaiah 65, following the ones before him, professing to be following Adonai, but they're not obedient to his word. Verses 22 through 23, parallel Revelation 21 that also records this new heaven and this new earth that descends out of heaven. It's a new Jerusalem that has gates preventing anything impure from entering into that holy city. Verse 23 specifically includes all mankind. Not just for the Jewish people, which is what Shaul or Paul confirmed in Ephesians 3 and Galatians 3. Gentiles are joint heirs, joint partakers with us, joint citizens with the nation of Israel, the Jewish people and all of God's promises. We are Israel. 
But if we are Israel, we have to live and act like Israel. We have to be obedient to God. We have to follow him. His word has to circumcise our hearts. We have to live obedient, pure lives before him. All the kingdom is to learn the ways of God, not the ways of the nations. Jeremiah speaks to this. In Jeremiah 10, starting at verse 2, here's what the, what the Lord says. Don't learn the way of the goyim, the Gentile nations. Don't be frightened by astrological signs, even if the goyim are afraid of them. For the customs of the peoples are nothing. They cut down a tree in the forest. A craftsman works it with his axe. They deck it with silver and gold. They fix it with a hammer and nails so that it won't move. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber patch, it cannot speak. It has to be carried because it cannot walk. Do not be afraid of it. It can't do anything bad. Likewise, it's incapable or unable of doing anything good. Now, this is a profound heavenly revelation, a warning from God. Though many, especially in the Messianic realm, believe this passage is talking about the Christmas tree, and it might be. But more importantly, it's a stern warning not to learn the ways of the nations. As Isaiah conveyed, we are not to engage in and perform their rituals and practices of the nations, of the Gentiles. Unfortunately, their church has done this for millennia. In order to win converts, many cult practices they couldn't stop or abolish, so they incorporated them into their expression of worship, which is why we have so much falsehood in things we do today. Where in the Bible does it tell us to worship the dead? Where in the Bible does it tell you to dress like Satan? Huh. Yet we do it every fall. And the body of Messiah is involved in it. Oh, it's just good fun for the kids. <laughs> That's my child dresses the witch right there. Really? What it is is a grievous sin that has prostituted the greater body. Yeshua said in Matthew 15, verse 9, their worship of me is useless because they teach man-made rules as if they were doctrine. It's ironic that 2,000 years later we're at the same place that he was at then. Today is just as it was 2,000 years ago. Religion has overcome relationship. Doctrine and dogma have replaced the word. We can't change or amend God's word to make it conform to our beliefs and narrative about life. Paul shared in Romans 12 that we are not to be conformed to the standards of this world. Rather, we are to be transformed so that we may know what God wants. How Satan's been at work for millennia to lead astray God's people into air, away from truth, apostasy, and sin. Yeshua spoke of this in Matthew 24, verses 24 and 25. He said, there will appear false messiahs and false prophets performing great miracles, amazing things. So as to fool, plan Ao in the Greek, which is to lead astray, to lead aside from the right way, to lead away from the truth, to lead into air, to fool, to deceive, to be led into air, to sever or fall away from the truth, to be led away into air and sin. Even the chosen, the elect of God, if possible, he says, there, I've told you in advance. He told us 2,000 years ago we'd be suffering and facing what we're at and experiencing today. Being led away from the truth. The deceit will go right to the end. That's the bad news. Even the elect of God, today's champions of the greater body, are being fooled, deceived, and led astray. I had a conversation this week about the one person that fell, and that person said to me, well, you know, some, they, somebody put people in there to trap them. Think about that. If you're a man of God, and you're serving God, and you're accountable, there's traps and snares every day in a person of God's life. That person caved into the temptation, regardless if it was planted there or not. But what is that cognitive dissonance? Well, it's really not his fault. It was a plan. It is his fault. In the end of Matthew 24, starting at verse 7, 37, I'm sorry, Yeshua said, for the Son of Man's coming, his return will be just as it was in the days of Noah. Back then, before the flood, people went on eating, drinking, taking wives, becoming wives, right up till the day Noah entered the ark. This is always fascinating to me. We've been talking for five years, something's happening. 
We've known something is coming. We've been preaching for eight years to, to get ready to be prepared. We've had outside confirmation. We've had inside confirmation. We've been pressing for purity. We've been pressing to hear the voice of God. We've been pressing for revival, for outpouring, because we said week after week after week, something is happening, something big. I went back and reviewed my notes from January, almost predicted exactly what we're doing right now. We've all known it. In Noah's day, everyone saw this ark. It had never rained until the flood began. Think about that. The dew watered the crops. So all the neighbors, all the people seeing this guy building this thing the size of an aircraft carrier. And nobody thought to pause. Huh. I wonder if something's happening. They ignored it. Why? It doesn't fit the narrative right until the day he got on the ark, closed that door, and it started to rain. Verse 39 says, they didn't know what was happening until the flood came and swept them away. It will be just like that when the Son of Man comes. Never in human history have we been as close to this situation as we are right now. Then there'll be two men in the field. One will be taken and the other left behind. There'll be two women grinding flour at the mill. The one will be taken and the other left behind. So stay alert because you don't know on what day your Lord will come. There's entire theologies built upon this. But in the days of Noah, who was swept away? Come on, the evil. The righteous were on the ark. The ark, the, the water, that was judgment for the evil was the lifting of salvation for the ark. Come on. But the righteous stayed here. The evil are removed. He said it to be just like the days of Noah. Who's going to be removed at the end? The evil. Yeshua said he's going to send out his angels to gather the harvest and the tares are going into the fire. This was another two messages just in this chapter alone of deception and falsehood. Oh, how far we have strayed from the truth of the word. I didn't even get to the unpopular truth about our over 450 broken treaties with the Native Americans and their captivity on reservations. Children snatched for state schools. Yes, we've had a troubled past. But by getting to the truth, the real truth of the matters, we can put the light of Messiah and begin experiencing healings and restoration in the supernatural. But as we're doing shotgun prayers, just kind of blasting things all over the place and not really paying attention, we have to dig through the dross to get to the base of the truth. What's really occurring? This is probably more critical than any other time because I don't think we're going to have a very good fall. I'm just telling you right now, September, October, November, I don't think it's going to be a good time for America. And I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this because if we don't come together as one, we won't make it through. Regardless of culture, skin color, Jew or Gentile, we're beyond that now. This is the bride. He's coming back for the bride. He's not coming back for a Jewish synagogue. He's not coming back for a white church. He's not coming back for a black church. He's not coming back for a Korean church or a Hispanic-speaking church. He's coming back for a bride. The Word says he's coming back for a bride. This is the bride, Joseph's coat of many colors. And I'm telling you right now, we need each other. Or we're not going to make it. I heard a prophecy with Sid Roth. This is probably maybe 14 or 15 years ago. And the prophet said, there's a time coming in the near future when the church, the, the body of Messiah, is going to be put to the grindstone. And the things that weren't of God won't survive it. You could refer this as scripture to the refining fires or the pruning of John 15. This comes full circle back to Acts 3, that Yeshua's return is actually hindered until the restoration of all things. We're going to be restored back to the way it was 2,000 years ago. 
Actually, we're going to be restored all the way back to what it was 4,000 years ago. It's going to be painful, but it's, it's necessary to see his return and see his glory return back to his body. Let's rise.